Hi everyone, I'm Liat Moss and today I'm going to talk about how I changed careers from an educator to my current position as a software developer. So most people I know started their coding journey with a program that looks a little like this. My first program, however, looked a little more like this. So how did I go from teaching in a classroom to working as a developer? Straight after I finished university, I left Sydney where I grew up and I moved to London to work as a primary school teacher. While working in my second teaching job, a new computing curriculum came out and my school trained me in order to teach computing to the whole school for the rest of the year. The aim was to work with the teachers and students to help write a curriculum that the teachers could then follow on their own. I had never coded anything before in my life and I didn't really know where to start. I was suddenly thrown into a position where I had to engage students in a topic that I knew absolutely nothing about. I attended a training course on Scratch, an MIT coding website, which is where I wrote my first coding program using Blockly. Blockly is a block-based coding language designed for children to help teach coding concepts. I had so much fun at that initial training that it inspired me to learn more. There were so many great resources available but I figured I should start with the ones that would help me explain concepts to my students. So I went out and I bought any and every coding book for kids that I could find. And this is something that I still go out and do today. Once I'd gained more understanding of what it meant to write code, and I'd somehow proven to my students that I knew what I was talking about, I went to research other organizations and coding websites for video tutorials. Coding in primary school was still fairly new, and I figured that if I was struggling in my primary school in London, other schools were probably having the same challenges. I eventually found other websites which were able to do a much better job at explaining the concepts that I myself was still learning. And one of the first websites I came across was code.org. This is an American-based site that has brilliant videos to go with tutorials to teach loops, if statements, and functions, as well as many more. They use characters from Angry Birds, Frozen, Minecraft, and Star Wars. And this program not only helped me build my understanding of what it meant to write code, but helped my students gain confidence in their own knowledge as well. The open-endedness of Scratch, which was previously far too overwhelming, was suddenly a fun challenge that I could take with my students. And here's an example of one of those coding programs. So you drag the block, you click Run, and the bird follows those steps eventually getting to the green pig. Another great programming website is Code for Life. This one is a UK-based site where the programmer attempts to drive the Ocado truck and make the deliveries in a game. And I say attempt because my students like the sound effects of this so much that they kept crashing the car. This game is slightly more complex than code.org, and for my older students, I found that they enjoyed the challenge and the faster pace that concepts were taught. So this works in a very similar way. You click run, and the car follows the directions that it's been given in order to get to the red box and make its delivery. While these resources are created for kids, I still recommend all these books and websites for people I know who are interested in coding. As exciting as it is to write code, I find the block-based games where you can see something moving on the screen after just a few clicks of your mouse really helps people understand what's going on behind the scenes. And as I've mentioned previously, the way concepts are described are really easy to understand. And once there's a basis of knowledge, you're able to expand that to relate to most text-based languages. So what next? After about nine months, I had almost finished writing the early stages of a curriculum that the other teachers could follow. I'd started running training sessions after school and I'd have different teachers coming in to watch my lessons. I would be giving them the same videos to watch and homework as my students and soon their confidence in this new topic was building. I had been thinking of leaving teaching for a few months at this point and I ended up leaving to work for a charity that went into schools to, to help with teaching computing as well as anything relating to technology. While I did love my students and the other teachers that I worked with, I realized there was a big knowledge gap when it came to teaching coding and computing and that I was in a unique position to help as many teachers and schools find that same passion for coding that I didn't know I had a year before. It was in this job that I really developed a love of all things technology. A few months in, I attended BET, an education conference that became the place to see what was new in educational technology. 
I had my first experience with Raspberry Pi at this conference six years ago, and I now have at least 10 Raspberry Pis doing various things around my apartment. It was also at this conference that I found out about Raspberry Pi's educational training, Pi Academy, which I attended shortly after. I wrote my first proper Python code here, which lit up an LED when a button was pressed. And to me, that was some kind of magic. I hadn't experienced physical computing before, and I have honestly never looked back. From then on, every coding workshop I ran, all my coding clubs and holiday workshops, everything was centered around physical computing. And I'll talk more about that later. Around this time, I also started some personal projects where I played around with my new Raspberry Pis and I used the skills that I'd learned on that course. I also started building up a Twitter network, which was an amazing resource to answer questions and give ideas. The people that I've met both in person and online through Twitter have been instrumental in my journey and have definitely helped me get and have definitely helped get me where I am today. It was also at this time that I decided that blinking lights are wonderful and could have a place anywhere. I spent hours working on a top for a work event, realizing a few too many hours in that I couldn't sew, and I came out with this. These lights are connected to a code bug, which is a small microcontroller with some LEDs in the middle and legs that could be connected to lights and other things in the environment. I used crocodile clips in this case instead of my sewing to connect the LEDs, and I did end up wearing this to my work event, getting on both a bus and a tube. Once I started playing around with physical devices, I had a look at Makey Makey. This is essentially a keyboard hack, as I would tell my students. You plug this in and it replaces certain keys on your keyboard with anything that conducts electricity. It really never gets old telling people that you can play a computer game using bananas and old chocolate wrappers. Once you we were done making controllers for games, we made interactive robots. And in one holiday camp, we dissected the scratch cat for a game of operation using chopsticks. After a while, more education-based hardware options arrived, which used both blocks and texts, making them appropriate for younger and older students to learn to code. An example of this is the microbit, which I still code a lot of my projects on today. My love of LEDs and all things lights is still growing, and in February 2018, with the help of some other EdTech people I met, I created my first proper wearable that could actually be worn comfortably. This was very much the start, and it led to a lot more amazing outfits, which I do still on occasion wear. Which I do still on occasion wear. After the skirt, I used a similar code to write this hat. But this time I used smaller LEDs and I had to figure out how to wire them together. I also made the skirt after I had significantly improved my sewing skills. This is sewn on using conductive thread. And while it may look neat now, it is incredibly difficult to sew with. There were many attempts and many holes made before I managed to get it working. The knots on each end are also held down with sticky tape but because the thread is conductive, if any of the ends touch each other, it will short the circuits. So I made this one using a circuit playground express, and I found that the stretchy material of the skirt, the connection just didn't work all the time, and it was very unreliable. The circuit would just stop working. I eventually moved this design onto the same black skirt that had the ring of LEDs in the base. And while it didn't always work, it was a lot more reliable than using the gray skirt. While I was having fun building small outfits and of course loving all the different colored lights, I needed a new challenge. Due to this hobby, I'd I found an amazing group of people to connect with online. And after seeing my outfits, I had a suggestion by one of the people I'd met to create a pair of earrings. He suggested I look at the Gemma, a board by Adafruit, and I found, a I found a tutorial online showing how to wire this up. This involved a somewhat new skill, which was using a soldering iron. I'd done a small amount of soldering in high school, but that was over 10 years ago, and I didn't really remember much. The first earring I made turned out great. The LEDs worked, and I had a program which I'd coded and could easily upload onto this new device. I used Velcro to keep the battery in place, and there it was. I was wearing an earring that I had created myself. The first earring came out so nicely, and I was super excited to get started on the second one. So that's the thing about earrings is generally they come in pairs. 
My second earring, however, was a complete disaster that set off my smoke alarm more than once. I burned out the circuit on the board and I ruined two rings of LEDs. By the time I ruined one device, I knew to order a few more as backup. This was probably my biggest failure in this whole journey, but it is what I'm most proud of. I absolutely destroyed a number of small electronics, but I practiced. I bought a slightly better soldering iron and eventually I had a matching set of earrings. I have actually kept these broken electronics as a reminder to myself of what I can accomplish and not to give up when something breaks or doesn't work. I look at this often, especially when I was working towards my software goals, as it keeps me looking towards the future and what might come next with a bit of practice. And these are the finished earrings. They look so much better than I ever could have imagined. Once I'd built up my confidence in coding of electronics, I attended some Raspberry Jams. Raspberry Jams are community of run events where children and their parents can go to learn about coding with Raspberry Pis and other controllers. There are usually some drop-in stations that can be visited throughout the day with different activities, as well as some sessions that can be booked in. It's great fun and there's prizes and stickers given away on the day. Once we can meet up again face to face, I'd strongly encourage anyone learning to code to volunteer and if they can bring their kids to an event. Everyone is very welcoming and super friendly and after my first time of just showing up and meeting people, I was helping with some of the drop-in stations and I even brought a few friends with me to help. It's an amazing fun-filled day and a great place to network with like-minded people who are all passionate about technology. The children there really want to learn and there's always people around who know the answers that you don't. Around this time, I was running a number of coding clubs at schools around London. I'd noticed over the years that the number of female students was far less than the number of male students. There was usually a waitlist to get into the classes, so it wasn't something I thought too much about. When I started getting more into the tech scene and I was going to meetups and events, I saw the numbers in my class mirrored in these events. And towards the end of term, before we were taking in a new intake of students, I'd arrived to school with a different weird electronic attached to me. Sometimes it was my skirt or my earrings, other times it was a pair of shoes, and a few times if I was coming from other meetings, it was just a light up badge or a sticker. I wanted to show these young girls that they could be into computer games and technology, and there wasn't anything weird or wrong with that. I spoke to some of the students who walked past me about my outfits and why I was wearing them, and the following term there were a few more girls than last time, and most of those were still attending the classes when I left. There was a big push at work around this time to get more girls involved in technology. As a team of mostly women, it was something that we were very passionate about, and we started brainstorming ways that we could help with this issue. We had run a mobile app hackathon a year before, and we noticed then how few young girls actually attended the event. We decided to bring together a hackathon with my love of wearable tech to run a wearable hackathon aimed solely at teenage girls. We went into secondary schools and spoke with girls while I was completely covered head to toe in 80s, of course. And we ended up selling out of the event. We had 56 girls attend, mostly from secondary school, and we had one group from primary school. The aim of this hackathon was to create a wearable device which could help someone make their lives better. They were given two micro bits, a few strips of LEDs, as well as some conductive thread, bits of material, and a few sensors that had been donated. Each group came up with something that was completely different, ranging from a dog collar to help locate a lost pet to a pencil case that allowed you to share your mood. The winning group created a pair of pajamas with two strips of LEDs down the side. If you needed to get up in the middle of the night, you pushed a button on the shoulder and the dimmed LEDs can help light the way without having to turn on the lights. They can also be used by children who are scared of the dark as there's a timer on there to keep the lights on until you've fallen asleep. If you're looking to move into tech or you're already starting out, I would recommend attending a hackathon, most of which are now running virtually. Even if it's as a volunteer, it's a great introduction to the number of different roles within a tech team and everything you can do that might not specifically involve coding. And this was me at the hackathon in all my LEDs. At the beginning of 2019, after a few years in this position, I realized that I wanted to make the move into engineering. I'd spoken to a few friends who were at the hackathon and they helped convince me to take the step. I wasn't sure at this point what my path was going to look like and so I took a few months off to look into different courses. 
at one point I thought maybe I would do a master's in engineering but I decided that my love of electronics should stay a hobby and I also didn't really want to go back to study for a few years. While I was doing some freelance work over the summer, I was still working out if software engineering was the right path for me. I would spoken to my friends about what their day to day was like, and it sounded like it was probably the right decision to go in. I attended a Code First Girls course, which was a good intro into proper text based coding and website design. I learned HTML, CSS and JavaScript in their introduction to web development course. And throughout the eight weeks, I learned different web development skills. A few weeks before the end, we selected our groups for the final project. And in the last week, there was a showcase we were, where we were able to present a website that we'd built, showcasing all the specific skills that we, that we learned. This course gave me a much better understanding of what it meant to write large amounts of code and to work towards a project that might take days or weeks to complete. After this, I started focusing on coding boot camps and looking into what I needed to do to take those next steps into a career change. In October 2019, I finally took the plunge and started at Makers Academy. Makers is an intensive boot camp using Ruby, JavaScript, and Ruby on Rails. Their main focus is learning how to learn, and they encourage us to build applications in pairs and groups, giving us the techniques to find answers and solve our own problems. For our final project, we get to use the skills that we've learned throughout the course to build something in any language we want. We work in teams using agile processes to come up with a unique project, and then we present that in our final demo day. My group, of course, used hardware, and we built a Raspberry Pi security sensor, which was motion activated. And here's a short video of our project. So when you get your device, there is a unique Pi key, which you enter in as you sign up for the website. You can then set up your sensor to guard whatever it is you want, in this case, some caramello koalas. When the sensor is activated, there's a light and a buzzer, and you get a notification on your phone giving you the details of when that motion sensor was activated with the time and date. This then takes you to your unique feed when you can log back in on your phone or back on your computer. And you can see a picture of who it was that stole your chocolates. <laughs> I finished Makers in January 2020, and I started my first software job in Anthony Nolan in London that March, just as the pandemic was starting. Onboarding and starting a new job remotely was really not easy, especially as I've been working for a lot of that time from Australia. But the team have been fantastic and have tried to make this whole process as easy as possible. So what were my biggest takeaways from this journey? It's not hard, it's new. This is something we get told at Makers a lot. You are learning and it's going to be a challenge, but that's how you grow. I'm still repeating this phrase to myself pretty much daily, even one year into working as a developer. There are always things to learn and you should be challenged because it shows that you're making progress. There are many ways to network within the tech community, either through meetups, developing a network, or connecting with people on LinkedIn. If you're just starting out or you're considering a career change into tech, these places are a major lifeline. When I first started at Makers, or probably even before when I was questioning if this was something I wanted to do, I was going to a meetup pretty much every day. Some of them were relevant to what I was learning and others just because I was interested. Most of the time, I didn't have a clue what people were presenting about, but speaking to people and having a chat over a slice of pizza was far more valuable than some of the talks themselves. I know it's different at the moment with meetups being remote, but there's still a great way to hear about interesting things people are doing at work, and they can be really good topics to mention in interviews. And finally, dare to be different. Coming from a non-traditional background into tech makes you unique. You'll have a specific set of skills which will help set you apart from everyone else, and it's one of the best things you'll bring to a team. For me, when I was interviewing for jobs, I would always make a point of highlighting my teaching and education background. As a teacher, communication is really important, and if I'm not explaining concepts clearly in my lessons, students will get left behind. This is a, great, this is a really important skill in software development. 
If I need to explain to someone what I'm working on, it needs to be done in a way that is clear and concise. Users need to know how a specific feature is going to impact them and communication and communicating in a way that is clear to both people who understand the technology and people who don't is a really specific skill. Thank you very much for listening to me today and please reach out with any questions you may have.